just looking at the shows today, you know, and, and, and handicapping and when Chris and I do the recaps on Heavy Muscle Radio, there have been a couple of shows that were, you know, the, the guys were not that great at. And I think that I could have beat a couple of those guys. <laughs> created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. If you're, because if you're in 130 grams of carbs spread over five meals and a sixth with no carbs, 30 minute cardio, five days a week, uh, you lose weight gradually. Do you think it's necessary to change uh, to a, cre uh, I guess, change from that to a keto pre contest? Well, it depends how your body's responding. You know, if, if your body responds to that and you feel good on it, you can stick to it. Look, my whole thing is that, you know, we all know you need high protein. There's no doubt, there's no debating that. Okay. And you do need some essential fats, right? I mean, there's a certain essential fatty acid requirement. So you can't go zero fat. I mean, not every day at least. And you should certainly be taking an essential fatty acid supplement like Omegalyze, whether you're on a zero fat day or not, because those that's stuff that your body needs for repairing muscles, for making certain uh, hormones, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, okay, if you're doing that, okay, on a regular basis, you know, then <laughs> I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, I, he goes on about like again his uh, what he's car, his current regimen, right? Uh, five days a week. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I'm right, sorry. Right. If that's working for you, then you don't have to keto pre contest. Right, right. If that's working for you, you don't have to go lower than that. Now, if you're not losing weight, given that, okay, that those macros, then you're going to have to change something. So what I do is with my guys is I I do something similar to that. I give them carbs with protein, you know, with with a little bit of fat. And then what I do is if I feel like they're not losing or they got stuck, I might every third day or every second day, I might give them a, like a, a low day where they're not eating any direct source of starchy carbs so they're doing protein and fat. And that's like that low day depletes them down really well. And it, and it usually initiates some more fat burning. And then the next day they're back on carbs again. So they, you know, they're, they still have the energy they need. Their body doesn't even know that they were on no carbs the day before. A lot of times they feel even better because the, the keto days where they're doing protein and fat is actually higher calories. It's just not, there's just no direct source of starchy carbs. So that seems to work well. And people like it because it's kind of, it adds a little diversity to the diet. Because if you're doing the same diet and just varying carbs throughout the day, okay, some days you're eating high carbs, some days you're eating low carbs, but it's the same diet, it can get boring. It can get a little boring. So the ketogenic with the carb diet kind of alternating kind of makes it a little easier. And, and you're gradually transitioning so that even if I get to a point where I have to give you more fat days than carb days, it's not a big deal because you've, you've done it over a very long, slow transition. And, and that's the key. It's, it's, to, it's to make the changes based on what you're seeing in the person's physique. Sometimes I, I get to a point where they're eating three or four carb, uh, no carb days in a row, and, I, and, the, and then the weight loss stops. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got to give them more carbs because now their metabolism might be shutting down a little bit. So I play with that. And that's what a good coach does. There's, there's no set in stone way to do it. I can give you templates in the in the, um, the Dave Palumbo Experience app to follow. But after a while, you have to modify them based on who you're working with. And that's the key. So there's, you know, if something works, though, don't change it. You know, I have, a, I have people I've worked with. They're like, you haven't changed the diet in 10 weeks. I said, you've lost two pounds every single week for the, for the last 10 weeks. Why would I change it? It's working perfectly. He goes, it feels too easy. I said, well, you're lucky. Because once I have to start giving you a lot of cardio and changing the diet, you're not going to be happy anymore. So be thankful that it's working. And so, you know, sometimes we have this mentality as, as bodybuilders where we want to actually, we think we need to suffer more, you know, but um Sometimes you don't have to. Some I've worked with people where I tortured them 
three years in a row. And then the fourth year we worked together, it was the easiest diet of all time. It's because they built a lot more muscle. Their metabolism was better. They got used to the diet and now it works great. So you, you just don't know. You have to base what you do with someone based on how their body responds. Let's go to Chad Schultz or Schultz. Um, what would you recommend for someone who has uh, had a PSA score in the high fours, low fives for the past three years? I mean, I'm assuming they, you know, they probably got an ultrasound of their prostate done, maybe even a biopsy. I mean, if you, if, if the doctor says you're good and you don't have prostate cancer, I mean, a, a simple biopsy, I mean, no one wants to get a biopsy of their prostate. I mean, they got to stick a needle in there, but I mean, if your PSA is high and the doctor's concerned and your prostate is enlarged, I would get a biopsy because the biopsy will tell you yes or no. You know, some people just have enlarged prostates. Usually the PSA doesn't go up from just a, an enlarged prostate. It usually goes up because th there is potentially, you know, some cancer cells in there, but not always. There are things like inflammatory and inflammation can cause the PSA to go up. Like if you got prostatitis, which would be like a small infection of your prostate, that would jack the PSA up high. You would think, oh my God, I'm going to die uh, of cancer, but you don't have cancer. You just have an infection in there. So you have to kind of diagnose what's going on. It's hard for me to make a, a blanket statement about what's going on with your prostate without seeing all the data and, and, and all the test results. But you should certainly definitely get an ultrasound of that. And you should maybe, and like I said, if the doctor's concerned, get a, a biopsy. Or if you're concerned, get a biopsy because that'll tell you, you know, one way or another what's going on. Um, if the doctor doesn't seem worried about it and he's like, let's just keep an eye on it, then I, then I wouldn't worry because PSAs go up and down all the time. Like I said, it's, it's based on inflammation a lot of times in that prostate. We had a question earlier about uh, injection sites. Those so questions from NY Bigger, kind of a more expansive uh, question to the you know previous one. <clears throat> Is it possible that as you get older, your injection sites become more sensitive? I've been pinning for decades uh, or only dorsal gluteal site and find that in my older years, that site has become very sensitive. I only pin one CC once a week. And after each shot, that area is so sensitive that I can't pin it again for the follow, can't pin it again the following week. I have to alternate sides, which is fine. Is this just a normal part of aging? When I was younger, I could do, I could pin two to three cc's per glute multiple times a week. I guess to answer that question, I always say, you know, uh, Chris Cito and I talk about this. We talk about young, fresh-looking muscle. When you see a guy who's in his like 22, 23, and they got this beautiful round muscle, there's no bumps and lumps in it because they haven't taken that many shots. You know, the longer you inject into a place. Scar tissue invariably builds up. It's impossible. Even if you do a perfect injection every time, deep in the muscle, you're going to get some, you're going to get scar tissue building up and that can irritate the nerve. And then you, what you do is you're putting fluid in there over and over and over again and it, and it, and it can just irritate what's going on in there. So yes, if you're doing repetitive injection sites in the same area, even if you're doing sterile technique and even if you're you know, not putting too much in there, over time, it has nothing to do with age. It's just over time, repetitively doing it over and over. Now, if you were 60 years old and you decided to do your very first steroid cycle, you're not going to have pain in that area because all the muscle is nice and fresh and soft and there's no scar tissue in there. It's just a matter of how long you've been doing it. I promise we would hold this question off till the end. It's from uh, Sarah Bogish. Uh, and, and I just wanted to point one thing out, um, you know, on Facebook. Again, these are certain, certain features where, uh, you know, with Facebook fan pages, you, know, you have certain um elements right to following a uh, following a page you get you know award certain things like for instance like top fan right now obviously that would you know i guess entail that that fan is a lot more engaged with our page so you know what for what it's worth if they're going to ask a question on the show we're going to give them preference and that's just uh something that we do uh we want as as a thank you and you know just um uh it's something where again we appreciate all your support and and furthermore your constant feedback, you know, to our posts, um, be it on Ask Dave or be it for any of the other content uh, or show previews that we post throughout the course of the week. Uh, so the question is, and it's been one that you've been asked before, um, various parts of, well, had you turned pro, what, you know, what next? So this question is, um, if you had gotten your pro card and competed in a pro show, well, today, like today, if you had gotten your pro right. card today, uh, how would you do how would you place with with the size and rip condition of your career uh i mean somebody you know kind of said well they hand up pro cards what's he gonna say you would have a pro it's not to say that if you got a, you have a pro card today right. and you're competing in today's era right if you competed five six years as a professional what would you have accomplished 
you know, it's it's obviously it's totally speculative because I don't know. Let, yeah, let's let's course. let me qual- let me qualify the question a little bit. Let's assume that I don't have shoulder injuries, okay? So because the shoulder injuries cut my career short. I pr- it probably saved my life too because I maybe maybe stop earlier than I probably would have. I probably would have gone another couple of years, but. You know, my shoulders were definitely, you know, were very sore. And I, and I didn't feel that I could be better than I was the year before because I couldn't pose them properly. I couldn't train them properly. So I stopped. But let's assume that I got a pro card and, and I didn't have shoulder issues. I, I think I probably could have snuck a couple top five placings in some of the smaller pro shows. I don't necessarily, I don't think I would have won, you know, any pro shows. I, I just don't think that I had the structure to do it. I'm sure muscle size wise and conditioning wise, you know, I, I could have hung with anyone. And, and, and you know, if, if I would have hit a weak show, I, I could have done well. But I don't think I would have – it was probably better that I didn't get a pro card because that would have – you know, if I would have got it, I would have felt obligated to, 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 to compete, right? Because, oh, well, I never – I want to do a New York Pro because it's Steve Weinberger's show. I wanna, I'd like to get an invite to the Arnold. You know, it, it, you know it, it would be one of those deals. And I probably would have stayed around too long, you know, <laughs> longer, than, longer than I should have. So – I believe everything happens for a reason, but yeah, I think I could have snuck out of fifth place maybe at some of these shows. Just looking at the shows today, you know, and, and, and handicapping and when Chris and I do the recaps on heavy muscle radio, there have been a couple of shows that were, you know, the, the guys were not that great at. And I think <laughs> I could have beat a couple of those guys. I'm not saying I would have placed at the Arnold or, or the Olympia. No way, no how. Those guys are much better than me. I would never even put myself in a class with them. But there were a couple of shows that, you know, that was, it was the lineups were pretty weak. And maybe I would have snagged the fifth place. So I, I, I believe me, I'm my own worst critic. I, I am the, the, the last person to say I, I would have done this or done that. I, when I look at when I look at pictures of myself, I all I saw was flaws in my physique. I never saw like the, the good things. And that's what a good bodybuilder does. You can't look at yourself and say, "Wow, what a great physique I got," because then you'll never fix anything. You'll never you'll never get better. You always want to say, "Oh, I need more of this. I need more of that. I need more back. I need to pose better. I need to present myself better. I need a better tan." Whatever the case may be. You have to be critical of yourself. Um, it would have been interesting. When I competed, I think it was a lot more competitive, you know, in terms of like, you know, and there weren't as many shows. So the fact that there's a lot more shows now, and and they do that because there's more pros now, right? you got to have shows for these guys to do. Um, would have made it, if I would have picked the show properly, I could have, you know, done pretty decently. But sometimes you pick a show and you think, oh, this is going to be a weak show. And everyone shows up at that show. It, it's it's There's no... There's no rhyme or reason. You just got to get lucky. That's why sometimes you see guys win pro shows that you never thought would ever win a pro show. And it's not that they're a bad bodybuilder. It's just they picked the right show. They were in the best shape of their life, and no one else showed up in shape. So that's the advantage when there's a lot of pro shows. So I like that. I like that we can see guys that you wouldn't expect to make it to the Olympia or making it there because that's 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 their that's the highlight of their career for most of those guys making it to the Olympia. They know they're never going to win the Olympia. They know they're never going to place top five, maybe not even top 10. So for them, making it to the big show is a huge accolade. And I, and I, I applaud all the guys that, that give a hundred percent to the sport and uh, achieve way more than people ever thought possible for them.